So good afternoon and welcome uh, to the communication signal processing seminar. Uh, this, so before I get started and introduce the speaker, I did want to uh, uh, thank Kate Godwin and uh, Shelley Felkam for helping organize the seminar. Without their um, help, this will not work well. Yes, anyway, so I'm delighted today to uh, introduce Suvan Mosh Bose, who is our seminar speaker. So Suvan Mosh is currently an assistant professor in the EC department at Urbana Champaign. Uh, he, his, I guess his research focuses on facilitating the integration of renewable and distributed energy resources into the uh, grid edge. So he's interested in power systems. But his background is broader. He also does things in, I would say he does things in control, network control systems. And so for his research in power system, for example, he uses tools, leverages tools from optimization, control, and control. Um, he's also been doing a lot of work now on reinforcement law. Before joining Urbana Champaign, he was a, a postdoctoral uh, fellow at the Atkinson Center for Sustainability at Cornell University. Prior to that, he received his uh, MS and PhD degrees from Caltech in 2012 and 2014, respectively, where he worked with uh, both Stephen Lowe and Adam Green. He received the NSF Career Award uh, in 2021. He's been a co-recipient of Best Paper Awards at uh, the IEEE Power and Energy Society General Meetings in 2013 and 2019, respectively. His uh, work has been supported by grants from NSF, PSERC, Civil Energy Institute, and C3.AI. So, um, with this, I give the floor to uh, Subhanmosh. So go ahead, please. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for inviting me to give this talk, and uh, thank you, Vijay, um, uh, for the kind introduction. So, um, when Vijay um, asked me to um, or invited me to give this talk I, and at this seminar, and uh, sort of I looked at looked at my own research portfolio, um, I thought, how about I take the questions in the power grid and then turn it into questions and sort of what underlying optimization problems uh, that uh, one needs to solve, and then perhaps uh, talk a little bit about the algorithmic architectures one one can leverage and the kinds of proofs and then so on that we can uh, come up with. So uh, so that would be sort of the, the theme of today's talk. My goal in this entire talk is to sort of um, motivate you to think that we may want to move beyond sort of a deterministic operating paradigm for the power system to not just a stochastic one, but a risk sensitive one, okay? And so this uh, uh, work that I've sort of been doing with uh, my students, uh, Avinash Madhavan and uh, Mariola Andrio, Mariola just graduated. And, uh, and uh, some of it has been done with my collaborators, Ye Guo, who's currently at the Shingwa Berkeley Shenzhen Institute, and um, also uh, Lang Tong at Cornell. Um, and uh, thanks to all our sponsors. So, so in power system operation, one needs to sort of maintain this balance between demand and supply. And this balance, I mean, is uh, maintained in a, in at, uh, and, and achieved at various time scales, right? There are multiple planning operations, and then there is in real time, you sort of um, clear one more market, right? Uh, and so roughly, if you can think about how this operation takes place, it's the, through this sort of a, the markets that run, they run sort of this uh, a power, uh, sorry, it's, a, it's an economic dispatch problem, which seeks to minimize the power procurement cost subject to the constraints of the grid. And if you, if I were to write it in the, in the perhaps an embarrassingly simple form, it takes this, this form, right? So you're minimizing some, some um, procurement costs subject to these constraints. Constraints are two form. One pertain to your assets themselves, whatever is connected at the grid, and then the grid imposes its own constraints, right? So generation minus demand, and, and so so it's fairly simplistically represented here, right? Now something complicates this picture, and that is uncertainty, right? The, I mean, ultimately there are two kinds of uncertain, uh, two kinds of complexities one can trace back all these kinds of problems with uh, uh, market clearing, they almost invariably turn into two different problems. One is due to uncertainty, 
so it complicates this picture right uh, and then the other kind of uh, complexity comes from non convexity that can arise due to uh, commitment decisions, integral commitment decisions, and power flow equations. I did my PhD on tackling the non-convexity of power flow equations. So um, let me talk today about the other, the other end of the spectrum, the other uh, uh, sort of problem that power system faces, and that is due to uncertainty. So I'm going to abstract away all the difficulties due to non-convexity and just only concentrate on the uncertainty bit today, right? So uncertainties in power system arise in two different ways, uh, I would argue. One of these, what I call discrete uncertainty, and then there are these continuous uncertainties. So think about the support set of these uncertainties. Discrete ones are basically certain elements in the power system can fail. Generators, lines, et cetera. And so one needs to somehow guard against these possible failures. Right, so that's uh, processing discrete uncertainty, and these uh, these kinds of failures are rare, by the way, uh, but uh, unfortunately not rare enough, right? So, uh, and when they do happen, they do affect a lot of people, right? Uh, and as you might imagine, transmission networks. So this is sort of the backbone of our power grid. So when it affects, it does affect a large portion, large number of people. The continuous uncertainties, I mean, uh, the, the audience of this uh, talk would be, uh, it's not surprising to them, a lot of wind and solar are getting integrated at the moment. Uh, and these resources are variable in nature, and there are some always forecast error, right? So one needs to worry about the impact of that forecast error and plan ahead of time against what you would do if the, there is a forecast error. So, it sort of these two things sort of make the problem somewhat somewhat different from a very classical simple way of looking at this right now discrete uncertainties people have been looking at it for a for a long time uh, and a lot of proposals are on the table and i'll show you what we have done in that regard and then in the continuous uncertainties world which is sort of the solar and the wind which is sort of um uh, you know back even uh, uh 15 years back, one would say, well, these resources are coming. Uh, you can't say that anymore. The resources are here and they are growing. So uh, one needs to worry about it now, right? Okay. So uh, in this talk, as I said, I'm going to process uncertainty and in tackling or explicitly tackling uncertainty, I'll tackle it through a uh, very popular risk measure. It's the conditional value at risk. If you think about some loss, chi, right? Then the conditional value at risk with an alpha, let's say alpha is 0.95, would basically say that take one minus 0.95, so that's uh, 0.05, 5% of the worst case possible losses take its mean. So with a continuous distribution of a loss, the CVAR computes this expected tail loss. Make sense? Now you can, uh, even with uh, uncertainties, uh, uh, or, or a random variable that can uh, that that can have atoms in it. Uh, you can generalize this definition, and this is sort of the the definition of CVAR now is uh, due to the seminal work by Rockefeller and Uriasev uh, for general uh, loss distributions. This is what conditional value at risk of that loss looks like, right? Now, what I would talk about is as it would become much more clear as as I go on that. This kind of a CVAR, the, the, this kind of a risk measure, while I'll also discuss what its uh, connections with other uh, sort of chance constraint optimization, et cetera, and so on are, they, these, this risk measure is really useful, this characterization, uh, especially for optimization. You can reformulate sometimes some of the optimization into a deterministic optimization problem, and this is known, this is not, um, uh, uh, not new from at least us. Uh, and some other cases where you have a continuous support, you can actually look at stochastic approximation with data, or you can look at sample average approximation with data. And I promise you, I'll look at all of those three in this particular talk. And as you might imagine, if the things are convex, in the convex world, pricing also becomes easy because there is a, is a rich duality theory that one can take advantage of to sort of define meaningful prices and, and so on, right? So and analysis becomes much more easy. Right. So that's with that backdrop. So power system has two kinds of uncertainties. I want to um, uh, process these uncertainties through this conditional value at risk measure. 
uh, and uh, design essentially optimization problems. And very briefly at the very end, I want to touch upon uh, possible ways to price. So that's the outline of the talk. Okay. Uh, all right. So with that sort of backdrop, uh, let me begin the first piece, which is sort of handling uncertainty, discrete uncertainty due to these security constraints. Now, as I was describing the, the uh, economic dispatch problem written in its really, really simplified form, it sort of corresponded to just this part, right? That is some minimization over certain constraints, right? Now then, so when you talk about security constraints due to possible what-if scenarios of these failures, one can impose certain other things, right? So for example, let's say that one line in the network goes down, then the network constraints change, right? Uh, and there may be capital K of those. And then so you can impose the, the most stringent condition. That is, even then, you, within those engine, the modified engineering constraints of the grid, my dispatch must remain feasible. But this is obviously uh, extremely, extremely uh, uh, conservative, right? Now, one can model corrective actions. Corrective actions as in, well, the generators can respond to such, such scenarios. So you can model those. Uh, in this particular formulation, there is no load shedding, but people have done that. And also, if you are going to modify your generation, uh, or the dispatch to, to uh, respond to such failures, then that will incur some cost and you can even add a recourse cost. And some formulations even have done that, right? Now, what we look at is this risk sensitive security constraint economic dispatch formulation, where what we do is we penalize the cost. There is a recourse cost, this is random, depends on which scenario you might find yourself in and with a tunable parameter alpha. Now, why do I want to do this C bar alpha? Now, suppose uh, let's not worry about how we solve it. Suppose we can solve this problem, okay? And uh, then let's look at an example solution of an I on an IEEE 14 bus system, just move from the right to the left on this graph. And as I'm changing alpha, I'm making myself more and more uh, risk averse. What happens to the, the, uh, the blue line? The blue line is the total amount of load shed. It generally decreases, right? While the nominal dispatch cost increases, right? Uh, now, where is the coupling between the different sort of these scenarios? So whatever the nominal dispatch is, that constrains how much you can move with this generation, right? Uh, uh, in different scenarios. So essentially, you become more conservative if you're risk averse, right? So this sort of alpha, this tunable parameter allows you to sort of go from risk neutral to risk averse. Right? And then the, the optimization program sort of favors more uh, or, or favors less load sharing. Right? So it's sort of, you can think about cost versus reliability being traded through this parameter alpha. Right? Okay, so if that is the case, let's just write this down and solve this as an optimization problem, right? Not very, uh, I mean, that, that's what we would try to do. Uh, now, if you, assume some linear power flow models, the problem looks as such. And uh, basically you club all your nominal dispatch variables corresponding to nominal dispatch, club, club them into or collect them into this vector X naught, whatever is for the other, uh, the in the kth contingency, uh, you collect them in the vector X K. And then you have some constraints on the nominal and there are some coupling constraints, right? This is sort of a general, very general looking, uh, of optimization program where sort of the, the constraints have a certain specific structure. Okay, you can write this up. This is not difficult. But then let's, the, the, the main point that I want to bring in, bring up here, let's look at the size of these problems. If we look at a 2000 bus network, sort of the Polish network, you can download these data. Um, if you formulate the deterministic version, there's like moderate 300 variables, 6,000 constraints. I can solve it on my laptop easily, right? The corrective sked is already at, uh, what is this, uh, around a million variables, right? And some 29 million, I suppose, right? Constraints. The risk sensitive one has a uh, whooping 6.2 million variables and 29 million constraints. And this is a, this is a 2000 bus network is sort of, it's, it's not the largest networks for which uh, markets have to operate with, 
right? So you can easily think about uh, uh, MISO or PJM who have to look at uh, tens of thousands of buses, like 40 to 60,000 bus networks, and you have to solve such problems. These, as, as this paper with uh, multiple authors from ISO New England say, these resulting linear programs are not even solvable by traditional LP methods. We think about LP as simple, right? Linear programs are simple. Uh, one, if you can cast your optimization problem as an example of, a, of an LP, you're happy. <laughs> In this case, it's a very large linear program. Right, so you can somehow curtail some contingencies, parallelize computation. So in this talk, I'm going to describe a sort of an algorithmic architecture that we've come up with, and sort of uh, talk about. Uh, I mean, it's still ongoing research, but let me share with you what we have so far. Uh, that is sort of trying to tackle these very large scale linear programs to solve it fast. Right. Okay. So write this linear program as this. What, what, what did I do here? I've taken XK and put it all into this, uh, sort of the optimal cost of this, this another LP, JK star of uh, X naught. And then I'm just putting it here, writing this as a optimization over X naught, right? This is sort of a master slave style architecture, uh, sometimes called, uh, uh, and sort of this, uh, or I'm trying to decompose so that I can parallelize computation. Nothing exotic still. Now let's, try to get some insights into how this cost looks like as a function of X naught. Now, there are uh, a lot of work has been done. These are what are called multi-parametric linear programs. It's parameterized in X naught, right? X naught is a parameter for this inner LP, right? And its cost structure is known to be piecewise affine and convex. Furthermore, the pieces over which this cost is affine defines a polyhedral partition in X naught. Um, and these polyhedral partitions, we call them critical regions. So let's, let's uh, uh, this, let me parse this mouthful that we just talked about. So if you can think about J1 star, essentially this is, let's say your space over which X naught can take values. Critical region one and critical region two are two polyhedral regions over which the optimal cost J1 star is affine, right? Then J2 star will also induce its own critical regions. If you intersect these, that gives you the critical regions induced by the aggregate cost, right? So essentially the cost is affine, 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 four different affine functions, which are connected at this point, right? So this is a piecewise affine convex function that you're trying to optimize over, right? So the algorithm that we have come up with is the following. You start with a point, you optimize over a piece. Then you check for optimality condition. What is the optimality condition for a convex optimization problem? Zero belongs to the sub-differential set. Right? These are these are possibly non-smooth functions. I mean, they are non-smooth functions. So uh, uh, how do you de determine zero belongs to the sub-differential set? But the sub-differential set, I don't know the sub-differential set at this moment. I, I have to compute that, right? So how do I compute it? Well, I know something about the sub-differential set. The sub-differential set is typically the, the uh, I mean, you can think about that as the convex hull of the subgradients of these different cost pieces, right? But I have only discovered this one piece. So far, I don't know anything about the rest. Well, at least let's test whether the zero, zero belongs to the sub, uh, so the what is defined by this particular piece. If it's not, then try to push out. Then again, optimize over that piece. That might actually return you back to the same point. But now notice that once I'm back to the same point, now I have more information about the sub-differential set. I've got two different subgradients whose convex hull I can test whether zero belongs to that or not. If it is, then we are done. Then it's already optimal, we know. We don't need to explore the entire space. But if it's not, then you have to push up. But now whenever I'm calling this from one critical region to the other, when you're trying to explore, make sure you don't come back, right? To the same critical regions that you visited. If you keep on doing that, then the, the algorithm can get into cycles. So we prevent that. And then ultimately, what you show is this will converge to an optimum of this piecewise affine convex structure. And the, the beauty of this is all of these different J1 star, J2 star, and all their uh, affine descriptions, et cetera, that can be computed in parallel. And not all parallel computation needs to be done all the time. Make sense? So. Uh, we actually did develop this algorithm in a completely different context in multi-area optimal power flow problems with uh, uh, Ye and Lang. 
in this uh, transactions and power systems paper um, a, a few years back. And then we realized that what we have come up with is basically a way to solve uh, very large scale linear programs, right? And so we applied it to this uh, risk sensitive context uh, in a 2019 general meeting paper uh, that was a contender for the, uh, it was one of the best papers, but uh, uh, in, in, for, uh, uh, at the IEEE PS general meeting in 2019. Now we call this algorithm the critical region exploration. Now, anybody who has taken courses in linear programs uh, or large linear programs, uh, you might say, this seems like Bender's decomposition. Uh, papers since the 60s, right? How is it different or, or uh, similar? Well, what CRE is doing is if you have a piecewise affine convex structure, it's going over pieces and then going to the optimal, you might push out to the neighboring one and then you can certify optimality. That's what CRE is doing. What is Benders doing? Well, Benders looks at one and then creates a cut. Okay, great. Uh, then maybe you can, maybe this takes you to the rightmost end and then you discover this cut. Okay, then my function now is the max of these two lines, right? And you will uh, end up with somewhere possibly to discover this piece. So I'm creating this global picture of what the function looks like, right? And then ultimately, once you have hit the pieces that are the that define the minimum, you're done, right? So this finitely many iterations convergence, this is very similar to Bender's. CRE also has that, but what CRE is doing is it's exploring on this uh, along the pieces to get to the optimum, while Benders is essentially creating somewhat of a global picture. Uh, on some problem instances, we have found CRE to be faster than Benders, but on some problem instances, it's the other way around. So we are currently in our uh, in in uh, collaborating with uh, folks at um, Los Alamos to figure out if there is a way to um, actually speed this algorithm up where there are certain advantages of CRE versus vendors. Vendors have to, has to solve in some sense, almost all sub problems, at least the, the version that we have done, CRE doesn't need to. It can only solve a few and get away with it. Makes sense? So, so that's sort of where um, this optimization algorithm that we are trying to build, it's just a fast um, large scale, LP solver that we are trying to sort of build for this. Um, and largely this design of the algorithm and writing a code base largely in C++, uh, uh, the, the uh, credit goes to my student Avinash Mahalvan. Okay. So that sort of finishes my first um, sort of half of the talk. Now then, once now we have sort of looked at one way of processing it, this is sort of, this is uh, looking at discrete uncertainty. Now let's look at a little more, uh, uh, an interesting version where we have continuous uncertainty. So if you look at this deterministic optimization problem, continuous uncertainty means that essentially one way to model it is if you have, let's say, um, uh, largely uncontrollable, let's say wind, right? Then you can think about wind as a random variable, and then the net demand becomes whatever your actual demand was, less the available wind or uh, the part that is sort of non-dispatchable at all. Completely cannot. You, you, let's say that you cannot uh, alter it at all, and whatever you can alter is in G. And if there is some forecast error in omega, that forecast error call it delta omega. I have to have some way to respond to it, right? And how do I do that? Well, uh, I can have, let's say, a, some nomin, rather than just G, think about G as composed of two parts. One part is sort of your nominal, and then some way to respond to this, some function of the forecaster that, that gets realized, right? So, and that uh, uh, one way to look at it is, is, is a simple version is with these so-called linear decision rules where uh, it's a linear function of the forecaster. So then a CVAR penalized CVAR constrained formulation of the, the same problem might look like this, right? I just opened up the, the problem description. Here notice that uh, there is a, there is a um, almost sure constraint on the, on the uh, power balance. Well, I can't really haggle uh, with uh, Kirchhoff's laws, right? That sort of power balance is there. And then the rest is um, 
saying essentially you're penalizing any any fluctuations of the power beyond the um, line limits through a risk measure. Similarly, you may not able to actually satisfy or or or, or provide enough uh, generation, but then you're again penalizing it through C bar, right? Now uh, you can look at our formulation. Uh, the the uh, there was a global SIP 2019 paper where uh, sort of this formulation is argued in a in a more um, uh, uh, in a formal manner. But uh, th there have been other formulations of similar uh, nature. Uh, uh, for example, Summers et al. from 2015. Now, why do I care about these C bars here? Now, if you allow me to take a uh, just uh by what i have to say here that this equality constraint can be removed and all the necessary things can be accommodated in the rest of the constra uh, constraints and the objective and can be turned into a problem of the following form c var minimizing c var alpha of a uh, random function and uh, subject to a bunch of inequality constraints of, of this nature right now, if you think about what this alpha and the betas are, this is where the sort of why, why C var and why this alpha beta parameters, why risk sensitive formulation in power system, at least for this problem, let's quickly look at that, right? So let's only think about the betas. Betas express the modeler's tolerance to the extent of constraint violation. So let's look at why I'm saying that. So if I, if I take betas to zero, C var reduces to expectation. So all you are saying is, all you want is that the average loss, doesn't matter what happens in one of the situations. All you're saying is the average, uh, not loss, sorry, average uh, power flow uh, is less than or equal to F. That's what you're constraining. So there can be bad instances where it's much larger than F, right? The other one is if you take to the other extreme, you're, you're pushing your beta close to one, you're essentially trying to, you're, you're trying for an almost sure constraint enforcement, which means essentially you're trying to say that or a robust constraint enforcement, right? You want it for all, at least the essential supremum of it, right? So it's basically the modulus tolerance for constraint violation, right? Now, if you if you were to, I mean, these uh, conditional value at risk is a very well-known uh, connection to chance constraints. Uh, these serve as inner approximations, inner convex approximations of chance constraints. So chance constraints basically tell you that it restricts the probability of violation. Conditional value at risk not only constrains that, but on top of it, it penalizes the extent of that violation, not just the probability of it, right? So now, then when we sort of looked at this problem and it looked like this, uh, this uh, minimize C var subject to C var, now we wanted to sort of solve this problem in a and we're keen on thinking about are there algorithmic architectures that can solve this one way to do is sample average approximation but here we sort of uh, were inclined to think about are there more interesting algorithms that we can design and what we came up with this is this stochastic approximation algorithm and so let me just uh, 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 it's a primal dual uh, stochastic subgradient based algorithm. So let me just quickly describe what that is. So, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll have a link for the paper uh, uh, in a couple of slides, but the way we designed it is, first we looked at just the expected value problem. So if you take alpha betas to zero, this is the problem. It's just expected uh, function with an expected uh, geometry. The goal is once you have an architecture for this, then Let's go back to the to Rockefeller and Urias's variational characterization of CVAR. Write it as an example of this problem with suitable modifications, and then run the same optimization algorithm on that. Make sense? Okay. So stochastic approximation, the way at least uh, we've designed this, is it's a just a plain vanilla primal dual algorithm, but with a twist. So this uh, this is primal descent, uh, stochastic gradient descent on X, given the, the dual variables. And then the dual is a stochastic gradient, uh, subgradient ascent. Now, how if you look at the sort of the classic 
algorithms, we made a small change and there is a reason for that change. I'll, I'll come to that. There's a reason for that change. Notice that, so in the, in the algorithm is you sample, you update primal, sample, you update dual. Now, this is the, one of the changes. That is, we sample twice. One is for the primal, one is for the dual. Okay. And in running the running the, the dual update, we don't use the value xk, but xk plus one. So the most recent value. So if you're familiar with this, this is Gauss Seidel update, then a Jacobi update. Right? Why do we do that? So uh, this is this the, the result that we are able to prove. Uh, and then I'll, I'll I'll discuss why do we do that change. We are able to bound basically give you a expected constraint violation and the suboptimality guarantee at an ergodic mean of the first capital K iterates of the primal and the uh, of the primal variable that you get. And what is this expectation? This expectation is measured with respect to the stochastic sample path. Because if I run it five times, I may get different solutions. Right. So all I get is uh, 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 an expected um, distance to optimality and distance to, and, and uh, constraint violation. And if you choose this gamma case to be a constant with a pre-prescribed number of iterations, capital K, then I can take a step size of gamma over square root K. I can turn this into a, um, with a constant step size algorithm, I'm achieving a one over root K. Uh, guarantee on the expected distance to optimality and an expected constraint violation. And this is order optimal, by the way. So how do I get that? Why is this order optimal? If you drop the, the constraints and look at the, the suboptimality itself, um, deterministic non-smooth convex optimization is a subclass of this problem. So uh, for which Nesterov's uh, uh, celebrated result says you can't do better than one over root K. And that's what we achieve. So order one over root k, right? Now, why Gauss Seidel versus Jacobi update? Uh, we were really surprised to find this actually. That alteration allowed us to, at least in the proof structure, it's a, it's a little algebra heavy, but uh, what comes out is that you do not need an explicit bound on the dual variables. This explicit bound on the dual variables, you al almost always, whenever do primal dual algorithms, uh, classical algorithms almost always have this bound that you assume and then you prove the convergence. Uh, we were surprised to find, I mean, there are schemes, uh, Borkar and Mines paper talk about this, uh, 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 Nedich and Ozdagler uh, had a different scheme to sort of tackle these, uh, the lack of dual uh, bounds uh, through sort of processing a Slater point, et cetera. But surprisingly, we don't, uh, we don't uh, need a, an explicit dual bound, but rather in our proof itself, we prove that it will not have an unbounded growth. So that's sort of one of the key contributions of this paper. And after you've designed this, once you've designed this, now you can think about, well, if I give you some epsilon budget or tolerance on this, this, this violation, right? What kind of gamma should I choose? So essentially that turns out into a, an optimization problem for which you can uh, give a closed form expression. So basically you can get an optimized step size for, uh, but again, whenever I say optimized step size, let's be cognizant, this is using an upper bound optimizing an upper bound always has its problems. And it would be clear once I discuss an example. Uh, but then once you've done that with the expected value problem, now let's turn to conditional value at risk uh, based problem, and then use variational characterization of Rockefeller and Uryasev, apply this with some modifications, and you're able to show a result of this form. So it's basically one over square root K rate for a CVAR constraint CVAR uh, penalized optimization. Now, something that is interesting here, notice that here it's a, it, this, this right hand side, right? I've written it in a very specific way. It's eta of alpha beta over root K. Why am I writing it that way? Now notice that these, these, uh, these in the expected value problem, I had these constants, right? That were functions of the, uh, or those were, uh, I mean, depends on the functions some constants, Lipschitz constants, et cetera. 
So, uh, sorry, the, the bounds on certain uh, subgradients, et cetera. And so once you start looking at this, well, for a risk penalized version, these etas now become function of alpha and beta. So now if I look at the delta of alpha, eta of alpha comma beta divided by square root capital K, and I then again optimize my step size, I can get a K star of alpha comma beta. But then if I look at K star of alpha comma beta and how alpha beta affect K star, so how is my optimal iteration count? How does it depend on my risk parameters? So this really is, uh, actually this was one of the reasons we did this analysis. I was very, um, uh, as a, as a, as a, as a uh, uh, was back in probably 2013, 14 ish, uh, or 2014, when I sort of read the chance constraints uh, analysis by Campy, Calafiore, and Garati, and uh, sort of the, 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 how does these risk aversion affect iteration complexity? And what I wanted to understand is is there a way to do that for conditional value at risk? And that's what we've essentially obtained. K star of alpha comma beta. Optimize steps iteration complexity as a function of alpha and beta for this stochastic approximation algorithm. Um, so let's go through a quick example. If, if you write down a very simple example of this form, uh, then you can in fact evaluate these. So the way we have evaluated this capital F and capital G1, notice this is the C var is my capital F one, right? And to determine that, I have I mean, computing C var for each X, you have to spend some time. So for each X, uh, we sample a million uh, omegas, which omega being the, the random variable here, which is distributed according to this. Uh, we sort of evaluate this numerically uh, using a million samples and then sort of plot this. And it, it, it's not very difficult to see that this would be your, the feasible region is the left of this, and this will be your optimal solution. And so um, then we run our algorithm on the Rockefeller and Uriasev's uh, variational characterization based reformulation of the CVAR, this problem, this example. And uh, what we obtain is this, um, the optimized step count comes to something uh, so I forget the exact number, but it's some, somewhere it's north of 10 to the nine, but this reaches the solution a little earlier. And this is typical of most runs. And again, this is the downside of optimizing upper bounds, right? And uh, what we obtain is that the, the, with an epsilon of, uh, I don't remember exactly what the value we took uh, with that particular, I think it was 0 0.5, 10 to the minus three, uh, you will get, uh, you get basically it's converging to this 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 point in fact in this case and uh, the evaluation here notice that it's sort of noisy this is the distance to optimality is nice but the function evaluations are a bit noisy it's the artifact of the fact that uh, artifact of this uh, this million samples that we have taken uh, to reduce our numerical error in computing siva you need even more samples especially given the log scale of this plot so uh, as I was talking about this, so and this was done with alpha beta, if I recall correctly, 0.2 and 0.3 or 0.3 and 0.2, one of those two. Um, but if you look at what happens to the, the, the number iteration complexity as a function of alpha and beta using, using uh, this uh, count that we came up with, you see that it increases fairly sharply. As the more robust you want to be, the more risk averse you want to be, it grows really. Um, uh, fast, right? And in fact, if, if what you can do is if you look at alpha is close to one, then that K star alpha beta, the expression is a little bit uh, algebraically slightly messy, but uh, it's sort of under certain regimes, you can sort of look at how it looks like. And it looks as such, it's one over one minus alpha square and epsilon square. Epsilon is your tolerance and one minus alpha square, alpha being your risk aversion parameter. So if alpha is being pushed close to one, you are requiring extremely large number of samples. But this is not surprising, right? If I'm asking you to solve a robust optimization problem via sampling, of course your iteration complexity is supposed to blow up. It has to see everything, right? So uh, this was not surprising to us that it would in fact blow up. Um, and so you can look at our paper, it's uh, still under uh, review at the moment. Uh, it's on archive. Um, 
uh, and uh, so this work is sort of we came from sort of an optimization problem in power and then uh, our goal was to think about can we design algorithms and rather than taking sort of the sample average route we looked at a stochastic approximation algorithm and sort of um, um, we were surprised by the the sort of the lack of dual bounding that we were able to achieve um, and then sort of apply it to the CVAR setting. And so um, there are some uh, numerical results that are there in the global SIP paper, but this paper is purely just um, written for these class of optimization problems. Okay, so I've 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 promised you that I I, I will do um, uh, sort of optimization algorithm design with uh, risk and tackle sort of the the um, the discrete uncertainty and the and the. Uh, and the uh, continuous uncertainty uh, to different sort of algorithmic techniques. Uh, but then something sort of was missing in this piece, right? My, my um, uh, title of this, of this talk is somewhat misleading if I didn't have this piece at all. Optimization is one part of the story. So what, when you want to run markets in, a, in power systems, uh, you have to sort of basically think about four uh, uh, parts of, uh, there are four parts to it, right? One is how are market participants supposed to bid an offer into this, right? So there's a market mechanism. Then there is, uh, oh, sorry, the bid and offer uh, formats that you have to design. Then you have to talk about how to, what is the formulation and what makes sense, right? So that's to an extent we have done. We've completely not done anything about the, the, the bid and offer format uh, in this at all. Uh, then the third piece is to actually run the optimization and uh, hopefully design it in a scalable fashion, some, somewhat theoretically sound and, uh, and um, uh, sort of uh, scalable. And then there's a fourth piece, this is a market. So you'll have to computer dispatch based on whatever you computed, you also have to price and decide compensations of market participants. So the pricing piece was sort of missing in this entire picture, right? And so what we started thinking about is, is there a way to price this sort of, at least under continuous uncertainties? The discrete uncertainty is being written by uh, my student is preparing a manuscript where he, he's uh, recently worked out something. This, this is also fairly recent, um, but uh, I think it's in a shape that I would like to uh, at least share a little bit about. So, uh, the idea was, can I price these risk-sensitive dispatch with continuous uncertainties? And what we essentially looked at is this, again, the same CVAR problem that we were looking at, but we make a couple of assumptions. And these are sort of um, motivated by this work that uh, uh, for the chance constrained world, there is a, there is a, uh, there is a paper by uh, Yuri Vorkin. Uh, Yuri's work sort of motivated us can't, so the idea is if you can do it for chance constraint, you should be able to do, do it for this, right? And so uh, we looked at a way to solve this and, uh, and define meaningful prices and analyze them. And uh, what we came up is, well, we made this basically the same assumptions as he does to an extent that is uh, nominal dispatch clears with expected wind and you are uh, not taking into account any more CVAR alpha, but it's just a expected objective. And then the problem becomes one of this. Nothing exotic, just copy pasted, changed whatever needed. Then you assign Lagrange multiplier to the power balance constraint. There is a, uh, a, a line limit constraint. And there is a sort of the regulation that you have to do when you have forecast errors. And so these are three Lagrange multipliers. And then we ended up writing this as our risk LMPs risk locational marginal prices. If you're familiar with uh, locational marginal pricing, this is the same formula for deterministic one. All we've done is we've taken the same Lagrange multipliers for the, for the CVAR sensitive problem and assigned them as some LMPs. Well, what are their properties? This you can show is equals the marginal sensitivity of the optimal cost vector of nodal demands. Same thing as classical LMPs. Second, it depends on congestion across scenarios through mu. 
in the deterministic case, it's just congestion in the nominal scenario. Here, it's not just nominal, but congestion across scenarios. And of course, this mu is derived from a sensitive problem, and so is lambda. Now, if there is no congestion in any scenario, this would go away. And what you will get is a uniform price across the network. And finally, if you take the, the forecast error to zero, it becomes a deterministic optimization problem. And no wonder it becomes exactly the same as LMPs. So this is the exact generalization of LMPs to the risk sensitive setting. Now, uh, I don't want to get in too, in too much into detail of this, but you can design even payments with respect to these prices, not just price times, this, because there is, a, there is a regulation component and there is a way uh, one needs to price that. Uh, sorry, one needs to compensate for it. And so we've defined those and the analysis is still pending. And a classical question that often is asked whenever you try to define prices in, in, in uh, power systems, is it revenue adequate? That is, if, the, if people are settled on these, based on these prices, is the merchandising surplus somehow greater than or equal to zero? Otherwise, what can happen is system operator can run into um, uh, solvency issues. That is the total amount of rents that, the, that you collect may not be enough to cover the rents payable to uh, the other parties, right? So here we are not able to show the deterministic ones uh, result where you have um, where you have this um, uh, flexibility of uh, uh, sorry the, the ability to show that it is greater than or equal to zero. Here you have to be a little more flexible. Here there is it's merchandising surplus is greater than or equal to this one term which is non-negative. This shows up in LMP calculations plus a risk dependent term. And again, the risk dependent term uh, sort of disappears if the if the variance of the wind is small and so on. But we have an extra term, and and we are um, currently uh, working on ways to see at least when will it be sort of can you guarantee that this will be positive, and when will it be positive, and uh, if not always, then what are when would you expect merchandising surplus to run negative, and so on. So we are sort of working on that. Can you calculate this? It's, it's coming from an expected value problem. So here we take a sample average based um, idea. So again, the way we have done it here, we've taken this copy pasted here, CVAR was changed to this expectation using the variational characterization. And in this slide, all we do is take the expectation and change it uh, to empirical means. Sample n times and then take empirical means. And then you sort of compute the prices based on the the this sample averaged problem what you are able to what we are what we see empirically no theoretical guarantees yet uh, but uh, these empirically you will see that these these prices stabilize as the number of samples are growing across buses right so these are locational prices so the prices can can be different and they are different for this uh, five bus example uh, and uh, the and what we see is as the number of samples grow they are converging. But uh, sort of the theoretical guarantee, uh, we are in the process of doing it, performing it fully. Um, I don't want to comment before uh, formal analysis has been done. And this is sort of Both, part. Right? Yes. Yeah, just a quick question here. So would, I mean, if you have a finite number of samples, won't you try to put in say, either use some principle of optimism or whatnot and have a basically add in some variance term to sort of counter Say that this is this inequality holds with high probability in some sense. So I mean, if you think about it, I mean this variance, etc. That penalization in a way is part of the optimization design itself, right? In the market clearing design itself, we are sort of penalizing that. But if you want this to be, so if you add a buffer here, you can add a buffer. Uh, but then the question is. So, okay, so there are two ways to think about it. One can, one can sort of increase these betas and do that. So you're a little more risk averse. You're more risk averse than you need to be. That is one way to enforce it, right? The other way to do it is, uh, as you said, to add a buffer just to be sure that this is ensured, right? Uh, yeah. So here we haven't, but if you are able to show that this with N, this goes to, I mean, how it converges. If you, I mean, this is a five bus network, 1400 samples. I mean, typically if you want to run these, you would use more, 
right? You you will use even more. And so how yeah, that's, fast? That's goes, what was not clear for me for a realistic problem. How what how, how much large? Happened? Agreed. So so that requires a formal analysis of how fast these prices converge. So I mean, sample average approximation, the optimal cost converges. We know that. I mean, these are well-known results. Um, uh, but to identify, I mean, at least I would expect that that uh, in, uh, a lot of these sample complexity guarantees have been achieved in for conditional value at risk. So I would imagine, uh, but the multipliers, you have to be a little more, bit more. Yeah, clear. I think, I mean, that's one another reason I was looking at. We are looking at asking for the multipliers to converge as well. Yeah, so this is a little more tricky. So one needs to be a little more careful. So um, I'm still in the process of, understanding what we can achieve there. Um, if it starts looking like if it's uh, it's like one over n or one over square root n, uh, I would be happy if it's one over n. Um, but uh, I don't know. We'll see how fast it converges. OK, so that actually brings me to the end of my talk. Um, so here, um, what we've done so far is looked at, if you look at what I've, what I've been talking about, and uh, I, mean, I, I truly believe once you once you leave the quasi static world and you get into the dynamics, is having a wonderful discussion with uh, uh, Ian this morning. Uh, that there are lots of problems, but in the quasi static world, most of the challenges that put into um, sort of uh, sort of um, these these operations, they are they pertain to they come from two different things. One is uncertainty, one part, and the second is non-convexity. And if you look at what we've, and in all of those regimes, you can think about then questions like algorithms and pricing, right? You have to formulate it, of course, and then you have to look at algorithm and pricing, right? And currently the formulation part, I've fixed it. The formulation here, I've fixed it to uh, a risk sensitive and the very specific risk measure, the additional value at risk. There, all we have looked at in this particular talk is some algorithm for the discrete one, some algorithm for the continuous one, and pricing for the continuous one. Uh, this also seems to be doable, uh, seems to be, but I don't want to claim before uh, formal proof is available. Uh, but what about if you have to add on the discrete plus continuous? That's a huge problem. So let's think about that for a second. There's wind, and then there are possible line failures. That's the, tr that's the, the reality of a of an of a system operator. Back in the day, you could sort of say, well, if there is no wind, I can roughly say which contingencies are going to be problematic. Now it may not be that easy, right? It might depend on the wind distribution, and so the, when there are multiple sources of uncertainty, how they interact matters. And so, scaling these algorithms up to that level, it's completely open to me. Uh, and so uh, how do you price for that? The next order of business, right? And so all of this is with a nice linearized power flow models. What do I do with non-convexity? I had been, uh, I'd worked on this uh, convex relaxations of power flow equations and uh, when can you guarantee zero duality gap? I wrote a thesis on this uh, back, in, uh, back at Caltech. And uh, once you put that into the mix, and the discrete plus continuous, and you want to look at algorithm and pricing. So uh, perhaps it's it's reasonable to say that uh, this will uh, keep us busy for the next few years. Um, and uh, this for this talk, most of this material that I presented, uh, the manuscripts are uh, should be available on on my website. And thanks to all our sponsors, and uh, I would like to finish this talk by saying. Uh, all the credit goes to my, mostly to my students here, Avinash Madhavan and Mariola Andrio. Um, I'm merely a transmitter of information and also my collaborators, Ye and Lang. Uh, with that, um, thank you, Vijay, for, um, for uh, inviting me to give this talk. So let's uh, thank both. I'm gonna open it up for questions. Anyone has any questions, please um, unmute yourself and um, fire away.
Hey, uh, so I don't have a question, but I have a, a comment. Maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we, we had a reason to work also dealing in a different context. We looked at the stochastic linear bandits with constraint, uh, mm -hmm. but we also propose a primal dual algorithm. Uh, then what we found is if we can add some uh, extra penalty to mm -hmm. the dual update, then we can uh, reduce the constraint violation to be zero while still maintain uh, the regret to be square T. I, so I'm I wondering maybe Simpson. So if you re read the paper, we have at least, I don't know whether uh, uh, this is the work that we cited, but yes, indeed, if you penalize duels, there is another way to do it. Uh, this is not the only way to achieve the, uh, the bounding of the dual variables. Or, or you can reduce the uh, bounding on the dual variable. I mean, not bounding on the dual variable, you can reduce the constraint violation to be zero instead of, uh, I mean, in your context, it'd be one over square T uh, we look at over a uh, horizon of t, so translate to square t. So you can make it a zero instead of square t by adding some penalty. So let me try to understand this. So mm -hmm. it's a primal dual method where you're saying that you will get, after capital T, you will get a constraint violation of zero. Right, 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 right. The aggregate constraint violation. So it's a constraint violation you add from time zero to time t. Oh, so these are what are the long-term constraints type. Right, 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 right. Uh, okay, right. okay. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I was wondering, I mean, it's a different problem, but maybe something can be done like, in your problem yeah. as well. Yeah, so in the long-term constraints, it's slightly different. Uh, so I would imagine, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. But does that guarantee that if you impose a long-term constraint violation is one over square root T, does that imply that the last iterate violation is zero? Uh, not a necessary, uh, not the last iteration, but the long term, if you add all the things together, it's, uh, it's zero or even become negative. So uh, you're right, it's then directly translate to the guarantee in the last iteration. But uh, yeah. uh, at least in the experiment, we find that it can uh, satisfy the constraint pretty well. Yeah, even in our case, our constraint is, I mean, almost all simulation runs for all examples. We got uh, zero constraint violation. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. But it's only the, only the I mean, a zero constraint violation. Yes, I mean, the, the, the constraint was satisfied, basically. If I, I, I'm fairly certain of what I'm saying, but I, let me refer you to the paper, but the example, sure. it discusses what happens at the, not, it's not last iterate, it's the ergodic over which we compute. Okay, then it's very similar. So what we, we are not compute to the ergodic mean, but the way compute is the number of iteration times the ergodic mean, right? So it's a summation. I see. So I think we are different by the fact of T. So divided uh, by, if, if, if your bound multiplied T is translate to our bounds. I would love to look at the, look at the exact result. Uh, would love to look at it. Yeah, uh, I will send to you. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, uh, I had one question. I mean, just I mean, I I had to go in and out of the talk, so spare if I give you any strange uh, remarks. So, how do you think about pricing in the discrete context? So that's a that's an excellent question. So, the way we are currently thinking, I mean, uh, so pricing security constraints is. Uh, Essentially, you want to, I mean, there are, there are multiple ways of doing it. One is sort of, you take this CVAR sensitive problem and you only price the nominal. Uh, so you send, you find the sensitivity of this optimal cost with respect to nominal demand at every node. That's a well-defined statement, right? And it will turn out to be Lagrange multipliers. Uh, I'm assuming this should work out. And, Again, uh, I haven't uh, gone through, uh, my student has just uh, 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 sort of done a very informal work and it is not yet fully formalized, but I would imagine that this would translate to some version of the Lagrange multiplies in the nominal scenario and the, the other scenarios and some, some of them will probably pop up, I would expect. So that would be sort of your uh, prices. Because normally, I mean, in the discrete optimization setting, what you end up doing is you basically look at a relaxation and show the relaxation is exact, and then prices come in from from those. In in this case, you are pricing only the sort of 
uh, in this case, you are not the only realized thing is the norming typically. Uh, the continuous uncertainty world is a much more difficult one where you you will end up with like the forecast error is uh, almost surely non-zero, right? Mm. Uh, it's a continuous support. So uh, in this case, uh, the the goal is to sort of think about whether some of the Lagrange multipliers will sort of be uh, sufficient or not. I Again, I, I see your point. One is to look at the relaxation. Uh, look at integer. I mean, there are these. Uh, uh, in in this case, it would be. What would it directly be? So in this case, if there are discrete uncertainties here, it's just scenarios, right? You have let's say three scenarios or five scenarios. Um, it's not completely obvious to me what would a relaxation look like here, because the yeah, no, maybe not. I mean, I think that's why I said I say something which does not make many sense i don't i don't remember your model or i haven't seen the model and it's yeah. this part of it so you have to uh, but i see what you mean if it's a bunch of discrete scenarios it's fine it's still okay yeah uh, that's basically a bunch of different constraints whereas if you have a continuous scenario then it's not it's uh it's like a continuum of constraint which is yes. another difference yes. About yes and the reason i sort of like the cvar is is at least if the original problem to begin with is Convex, Siva retains convexity of the of the stochastic yeah. optimization problem, which is sort of something that is, I mean, it, it being coherent is useful here, um, both for optimization uh, algorithms as well as in trying to understand um, pricing. In the chance constraint world, uh, one of the main troubles that comes from chance constraints is the the constraint itself defines a non-convex set most often than not, right? More often than not. Uh, so uh, that's sort of an advantage, but again, uh, it really depends in terms of, so it, it, one can do just the optimization and be happy about it, but uh, here we are in an application domain. So it it is important to sort of think about whether it makes sense in uh, to penalize the extent of violation rather than just the probability of violation and so on, that needs to be thought out a little bit and needs to be argued. Uh, and and sort of uh, in at least with the CVAR, the way I felt at least uh, things come together a little more nicely when it when it is about algorithm and pricing design. So in, in that context, maybe this is a, a side question in some sort. Have you considered any sort of risk sensitive control approach using? I mean, there are other other measures of risk, not necessarily CVAR. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there's a large community and there's a risk sensitive control from you. I don't know if you've tried, I mean, I, they may not be amenable to the analysis you did, but I mean, I'm just curious as to. Mm, not for power system, but I mean, uh, the exponential risk measure is what you uh, grow up learning about, yeah. right? At least in control. Um, there, uh, the LEQG and its relationship to sort of robust control and so on, right? So the celebrated results. So uh, in not in this context, but I mean, if you are looking at a continuous control problem, it does make sense to, uh, it's how you want to model risk is perhaps dictated by three things. One is whether it has these favorable properties, some of them, which means, uh, sorry, whether it models what you want to know. Right. I mean, CVAR constraints can, uh, sorry, chance constraints are basically VAR constraints. So you can think about them as also uh, VAR is a, a risk measure. It may not have the same uh, coherence properties as CVAR, but it is a legitimate risk measure. Right. So the question is one of, first the question is whether it is meaningful in the context. The second question is one of uh, whether you can design algorithms and so on to even solve these problems. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then the third piece is sort of spe specific to power system. Perhaps is this: what do you do if, if you have to price? Then is there something that you can do on top of it? And so, the short answer to your question is: um, I haven't looked at any uh, any of the other risk metrics for power system operation, except um, sort of trying to understand the 
the var constraints or chance constraints but uh, in terms of the other kinds of risk metrics risk measures to uh, for applications beyond this definitely there is a lot of scope so i want to uh, just follow up on that so uh, in the same paper i mentioned uh, because we are able to make the uh, constraint violation to be really small uh, actually, we are also able to establish some uh, high probability bound, like sample compressive, I mean, sample sample pathways uh, bound as well for the guarantees. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering, like, uh, if we look at here, we look at the expect value for the constraint violation, right? If we look at higher moments, uh, maybe there's also opportunity to translate that into uh, maybe uh, um, like high probability bound as well. I I agree. We haven't looked at it, but I so. Some more things can be done. Actually, it's there in the paper. And the way we did it was we took n different runs of the same problem and then sort of looked at what, and then you can do a little more concentration measures like uh, hoping. And that's where the relation to the chance constraints, the sample complexity comes about actually. Yeah. Um, uh, I did not present it here, but it's in, it's in the paper. So, uh, Completely agree with you. The the this is sort of a, this doesn't capture everything it seems because I mean we literally I mean this is sample path right and this right. is the excellent tolerance after this much uh, this means everything is done right x right. minus x star you're basically have gone to the optimum right yeah. so the point, uh, why are we why are we only look and this is for all sample paths we've done not a single sample path was like oh it was above epsilon. Yeah, yeah. So, so it seems like the at least from this example and uh, also yes. from our numerical experiments, yeah. we can get much stronger conditions. Much right? stronger guarantees. Isn't yeah, guarantees. Yeah. Proofs always lag what you see, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So, any more questions? All right, if there aren't any, um, let's thank Boss again. Thank you. I think there's a way to clap also, I guess we'll do that. Yeah. All right, thanks a lot, Vijay. Thanks a lot, all right, bye. 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 bye.